Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for our message today is from the Gospel of Mark, the 16th chapter. Hear this key verse. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, the women were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? This is our text. We don't know exactly where the tomb of Jesus is. If you travel to Jerusalem, guides will offer uh, a couple of suggestions. One, uh, one such place has a church built over it called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The second one is in a nearby uh, garden, called, and so it's called the Garden Tomb. Whether either one of these are the actual tomb of Jesus uh, is really not that important. But you can get an idea of what the tomb of Jesus would have looked like. You can imagine what it was like on that first Good Friday when they laid Jesus' body in the tomb. You see the openings of the tomb and that large stone that would have been pushed in the front of that entrance. It would have taken a couple of pretty strong guys to be able to move that stone into place. What we do know about the tomb of Jesus, though, is it was owned by a man named Joseph of Arimathea. He was a fairly wealthy man who would have had the, the funds to dig out such a, such a tomb. Um, after he and Nicodemus placed Jesus' body in the tomb, they would have had to push this stone and uh, roll it down that little groove or incline, incline that the, the tomb would have been, or that stone would have been in. There's like a little track until it slid into a slot, fell into place in front of that tomb. You can hear the sounds that that stone would have made when it fell into place. Thud. Well, when that stone went thud, it wouldn't go in any place with a whole lot of effort. Um, it was meant there to stay. Can you imagine, though, how, mu how much or how many men or how strong they'd have to be to lift that humongous stone out of that little groove and up the incline, up that track again? I can't. When it went thud, it was meant to stay there, or so it seemed. So far, we've been looking at the stone from the outside. Imagine what the stone would have sounded like from the inside of that tomb. You would hear the stone grinding against the wall of that tomb. Slowly the walls, or not the walls, but the opening of that tomb would, would gradually close. And then suddenly thud. Pitch darkness in the tomb. Silence surrounds you. Life is over. Done. Finished including some of the most joyous moments in life. One of the most joyous moments in the life of Jesus occurred when he had a meal with his disciples. I can imagine the laughter and the camaraderie and the chatter, the sounds of food being dished on the plates, the soft sounds of utensils being picked up and placed, uh, laid down, the sound of a, of a glass being filled and then listening to someone swallows whatever was in the cup. And at other meals with tax collectors and sinners, the sounds would have been the same, maybe even louder. But one day, Jesus pulls apart some bread and breaks some fish, and, and a crowd of over 5,000 people eat till they're full. With that many people, imagine how noisy that meal would have been. The sounds of a meal and being together with his followers had to be some of Jesus' more wonderful sounds. But all that would come to an end with a thud. The, tomb, the, the stone would be rolled into place. Everything would come to a halt. The disciples would run for their lives. Two men, Joseph and Nicodemus, would risk everything to lay Jesus' body in that tomb. Some women would, would stand afar to, to see where Jesus was buried. His body would be covered with darkness and there would be silence in the tomb. He's dead. A large stone is in front of the tomb. But then on Easter morning, everything changes. Some women come walking down the path to, to anoint Jesus' body with spices to cover up the order of death. Now the women aren't strong enough to move that, tome, or that stone. They, they are, they're willing to take care of his body, but... They've forgotten one little detail. Who's going to let him in? 
Well, when they got there, that little t detail, or actually very large detail, was taken care of. That stone, that very large stone, was already pushed away. Matthew tells us that an angel did it. We don't know how the angel moved it, but I'm sure it was no trouble for, for that angel. I imagine it would be like a, finding a, a cookie crumb on your sleeve or a flake on your shoulder. Just a flick, and it's gone. Flick. From the sound, of a, the sound of a thud to a soft flick, and the tomb is open. The women are amazed and afraid. There's an angel there waiting for them with a message, and the heart of the message is this. He's, he's risen. He's not in the tomb anymore. He's alive, and he's going to meet your disciples just as he said he would. What a huge message. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is larger than any stone. The stone couldn't keep him in, no matter how large. And so the women go in the tomb. This time, not to, not to look at a, or to, to anoint a dead body, but to hear wor words that would loom large for the rest of their life. He is risen. And just as Jesus said, he met with his disciples over and over again over the next 40 days. During a couple of those reunions, Jesus does something that seems so small and ordinary. He eats with his disciples. He takes a piece of fish and eats it. He has breakfast with them on a seashore. His point is, he's not a phantom ghost. He's flesh and blood. The scars are right there for Thomas to touch and believe. What a meal that must have been. Silence at first then dropped jaws. And finally, the laughter and the hugs, the noise of joy would have grown louder and louder as Jesus turns to the disciples who had deserted and denied him into men of courage. He turned the women who were terrified into messengers of hope. The sounds of a, a meal and being together with Jesus changed everything. Jesus was larger than that stone and anything else that could keep him from his disciples. Jesus' resurrection is huge, and it's huge for our lives as well. There was a student in uh, St. Louis who for a while had been a grave digger before he went to the seminary. He and his brother would dig graves, and then after the committal service, they would fill the grave back in. Well, one time was especially heart-wrenching for them, it was the burial of an eight-year-old boy who had drowned in a creek by his house. The mother wanted to stay and watch the burial. The brothers told her that that was probably not a good idea. You see, when you're shoveling dirt in the hole, those words dust to dust become all too real. But the mother insisted. And so the brothers began to push the dirt in the hole. Can you hear it? The sound, that is. One shovel at a time, or one load at a time. Thud, thud, thud. And then when the grave is full and they've patted the dirt down, then comes the stone. It's a gravestone. Now some markers are big and some are small, but you know the sound that a stone makes when it's placed in front of a grave. It goes thud. Grief and sorrow are painful. Someone sits down to eat at a meal and an empty chair stares back at them. The plate is still in the cupboard. The utensils are silent in the drawer rather than clanging on the table. The glass is on a shelf rather than listening to someone swallow from it. Someone's missing. A voice is, has disappeared. Whose grave is it? Is it someone you love? Maybe it's your own grave. This stone looms large. It's too large for us to do anything about it. But not for Jesus. One day Jesus will return in glory and power. The silence will be shattered and the darkness undone. He will come to your grave and the grave of all followers. 
and that gravestone will be like a crumb on your sleeve. Flick, and it's gone. Same for the dirt, and out you come. Bodies alive again, feet and hands that can dance and hug, eyes that will be able to see the beauty of God's new creation, ears that will hear the songs of praise that will make the Easter songs like a whisper, and we will eat. Isaiah describes that meal in our Old Testament lesson today. He said it would be rich food, drinks that will burst on your tongue in absolute delight. I'm going to be heading straight for the sweet corn drenched in butter and the roast beef and the mashed potatoes drowning in gravy. And then I'm hoping there's going to be pumpkin pie topped with ice cream. It's a feast. It's a banquet. A meal so great we'll never be hungry again. And we'll be surrounded by those who love Jesus. We'll be laughing and talking. Listen to the noise of that celebration. All because Jesus is larger than a stone. Isaiah says in our Old Testament today, he says that, that God will swallow up death forever. Tears will be wiped away. They are too small to stop Jesus on the last day, on the day of our resurrection. When those two brothers began to fill in that grave of that eight-year-old child, the mother began to cry, and her shoulders were shaking. One of the brothers went up to her. He was a manly kind of guy. You know, he's one of those hunters and fishermen, you know, real manly. But he gently put his arm around her and asked her if her son had been baptized. She nodded her head yes. And then, like an angel many, many years ago, at a tomb with some women, he told her that her son was with Jesus, and that one day she would see him again. You see, that simple message, he is risen, changes everything. It changes that large stone, and nothing can keep us from Jesus and that incredible feast that he has on the day of our resurrection. But not just on the last day. Jesus', de Jesus resurrection from the dead is not only affects our lives on the last day, but also every day of our lives. How so? Because, because now we can hear some of the simple sounds we hear in this place and know that nothing can stop Jesus from carrying out his will. Listen carefully as you hear water poured over a baby's head at baptism. No stone, no matter how large, can stop Jesus from claiming that child as his own, just as he did for you at your baptism. Listen to the lid opening on the chalice at Holy Communion. No stone, no matter how large, can stop Jesus from being here. <coughs> in life, with life and forgiveness. Listen to the pages of the Bible being turned. <coughs> no stone, no matter how large, can stop Jesus from assuring us that he is with us always to the very end of the age. Listen to the songs we sing today. No stone, no matter how large, can stop those who love Jesus from singing his praises. Listen to our prayers. No stone, no matter how large, can stop Jesus from comforting us in our time of grief. Listen to the cans of food that are being gathered for the hungry. No stone, no matter how large, can stop Jesus from feeding the hungry through our gifts. And listen to the laughter today as you sit down with family and friends. No stone, no matter how large, can stop Jesus from giving us a glimpse of that great feast in heaven. 
listen carefully to the message that changes everything. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Please rise. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding fill your hearts and minds with love for your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And may you never forget that because he is risen, he has promised to return one day to raise you to new life in his kingdom. Amen.